And I'll try to uh, dismiss this uh, thing if I can, but I'll bet I can't. Let's try again. Oh no. <laughs> uh oh. You just use the trackpad there on the right. laptop there. Yeah. It's a laptop. But it, yeah. it's, okay. it's, uh, and now I've really messed things up. Okay. So. I'll come on. There is another oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be the one. I no, oh, no, that one's not displaying the uh, the slide. So uh, we need Brian again. I'm sorry, but meantime, I guess I can get start. Oh, there you are. Okay, just need that out of the way. Ah, trackpad, of course. <laughs> so this should be uh, this this should be. If you, if you can't figure that out, you're not allowed to speak. <laughs> <laughs> So joint work with um, Marcus Curry and Greg Galloway. Um, what got us into this? Well, uh, that is a long story. So maybe I'll go through that as we come to it um, in, the, uh, in the talk. So I wanna start with a little cosmology. And I think for half, for the entire talk, I'll be in, in trouble with half the audience or the other half, because half of you know a lot more cosmology than me. And the other half knows a lot more about the almost splitting theorem that I know. So I'm gonna to try to tackle both, but I'm, a, I'm an expert in neither. Let's uh, give it a shot. Uh, FLRW cosmology has already come up plenty in these workshops. You take a metric, which is um, a warp product with simply a scale factor on the spatial metric, which I've denoted here by little g. The spatial metric, that factor will depend on time. And basically it's logarithmic time derivative is the so-called Hubble constant, which is not constant in time, but is constant in space. Um, FLRW cosmology admits only uh, constant sectional curvature, spatial slices. So K will be the um, spatial curvature here, the sectional curvature, and it'll be controlled by the mass energy density of the universe. And we'll actually come a little bit to that. I wanna bring up some observations and that's where I'm really in trouble, especially with the observational cosmologists. Um, but the density is measured from, in particular, Planck satellite observations of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, they indicate that we are just slightly more than the critical density required to close those spatial slices. So there's about an 85% chance we're just 1.01 times the critical density, and there's about an 85% chance that that's correct. And that will force the sectional curvature to be positive. Uh, I wanna emphasize that if the sectional curvature is not positive, that does not mean that the spatial surfaces are open. It only means that they can be open, but they could also be closed. And typically we rescale the sectional curvatures. You measure it and you, God knows inverse uh, megaparsecs or something, but we rescale to be minus one, zero or plus one. And in these units, then the total mass energy density being plus one will be the critical closure density. If you're above that, which we appear to be, then you're necessarily closed. If you're below it, you could be closed, but you don't have to be, it can be open. So, so Eric, this, Eric? I had trouble parsing the observational statement. Is the percent sign gratuitous? Is that correct? Uh, let's go back and see which percent sign you mean. So there's an 85% somewhere. Uh, no, no, before that, the percent sign on the previous line, it looks gratuitous to me. Oh, thank you. Yes, that one definitely is gratuitous. My apologies. Oh. Friedman, Lemaitre, Robinson, and Walker. Also, sometimes Lemaitre's name's omitted, so sometimes you see FRW, but constant sectional curvature, constant spatial sectional curvature is the translation. Um, all right, uh, so the topologies that are possible, if we are above closure density, then only spherical space forms, so the sphere or quotient, smooth quotient. Uh, if you are Below, if you're at critical density, a flat torus is possible. Any of the flat uh, uh, three manifolds, quotients of tori. 
And if you're below that, then compact hyperbolic is the only possibility within FLRW. And again, just for emphasis, if you're below density, you can have any of them, including the closed ones, but you could also be open, which I'm not going to worry about. Okay, so closed three manifolds. A little bit of the, uh, of the background, what is known about closed three manifolds. Let's see how much I have here. They are built out of eight so-called primes. And if we happen to have some cosmologists in the audience, I'm kind of hoping on the one hand we do, and on the other hand we don't, because they're going to make so many errors, but you'll be able to correct me if you are. Then these are the Bianchi models, except you'll know that there are nine, and this is enumerated in a slightly different fashion, but more or less these are the Bianchi models. Uh, FLRW do not admit several in this list. This is an easy one to visualize, the two sphere across the circle. Hyperbolic space, I'll just use H. The G is the genus or the number of holes in the uh, in a compact hyperbolic two space. Um, and they don't allow connected sums. Connected sums are just where you join, you take two of these primes and you simply join them with a tube. So as if you took two bagel, bagels on a baking sheet, but you put them close together and they bake together. All right. So the observations of the yeah, universe. Like, why do we need geometric spaces when we start talking about constant sectional correlation? Right. Why, why do you need to pick geometric spaces? Oh, because, because I'm going to dispense with I'm going to dispense with constant sectional oh, curvature. Okay. Oh, sorry, went too far. Ah, uh, where are we? Nope, wrong one. <laughs> I see. <laughs> oh my! We just there, got there. a preview. There we go, okay, let's go again. All right, so observations of universe topology. And uh, many of them actually, the, a lot of the analysis was done right here, um, just up the street at the, um, on the top floors of McLennan Physical by Dick Bond, and I think his postdoc at the time, Dmitry Pogosian, who's now at the University of Alberta. You can, uh, I always put this line in there for comedic effect, although it has none because I'm, I'm you know, my delivery is not good. But the first way you can tell if the universe is, uh, has closed topology is you stick a telescope out the window and you look for your own rear end. And if you see it, well, obviously that's a closed timelike curve. But basically uh, the most naive thing to do is really that. You look out in the sky one direction, you look in the other direction and you try to compare them. That turns out, of course, not to be, so that's basically, I think, the statistical anisotropy idea, but it's um, not a very good idea because the universe, if you look out with a telescope, you see stars, and therefore it's very non-homogeneous at present. That's clear. You need to, that, but you're not looking out very far if you do that. You need to look out in very large distances because presumably the closed curves, the loops will be very large. So then you need to look way back at very early times. The cosmic microwave background is an example of where we can look back to very early times. So that's a somewhat better idea. And to give for the non-cosmologists here, let me just quickly draw a picture that here we are, and if this doesn't get picked up on the uh, outside, it's okay, it's a very simple picture. You think if you're looking back in time, you're looking very far, but the universe has been expanding during this period. So you're looking very far along this line, yes, but, not very far in terms of the separation of sources. So at those very early times, the universe was very, very homogeneous and isotropic. You can tell that by looking at the cosmic microwave background, it is very homogeneous and isotropic. But the second idea, and Neil Cornish, by the way, was a graduate student here, but this idea came later. And I think Glenn Starkman was here as well at CETA as a postdoc. Um, their idea is the following. Think of the very early cosmic fluid, if you will, it's too dense for light to pass out. So you can't see, you can't see into it. The light is, is uh, always scattered and doesn't escape. Uh, say you get a little disturbance in that fluid. As with any, you know, drop a pebble into a pond, you get an expanding shell. Now, if the universe has a relatively small diameter and is, uh, has a non-trivial topology, that shell, you know, it'll expand like this, but it's really, colliding with itself as well, because you know this end is coming in from here and colliding. What happens then is you get an overdensity where the collision is and an underdensity somewhere else. So when finally the universe cools down to the temperature 
where it is this becomes transparent to light and light can pass out through without further scattering that transition will occur a little bit differently on the collision on the intersection set than elsewhere and that intersection set is going to be a circle right just take a sphere and collide it with another sphere you'll get a circle so uh, you should look for little disturbances in the cosmic microwave background that are circles in the sky. And that's better than looking one way, looking the other way. You know, either it all looks the same in the two different directions or it all looks vastly different. All right, there's a third method, which has been, was in the news a couple of years ago, just when we were uh, doing this, which is to study uh, large scale correlations. And I'll quickly say what I think that's about. <laughs> which is basically, again, if you have a compactified uh, universe, a compactified anything, and you try to do Fourier analysis, you put a signal on that. You can't put a wave in there that has a longer wavelength than the compactification scale, because if you identify this point with this point, the wave has to have the same amplitude here as there, so it can't have a longer amplitude. And one that means is that you are going to kill long wavelength um, waves on this little on this background of very dense matter that you're really looking at when you see the uh, uh, cosmic microwave background so the low order multipole moments of this distribution uh, will have a weakness and apparently there is a weakness that's observed but i doubt the cosmologists take that terribly seriously but i do see some cosmologists in the audience so i'm uh, I, I, I'm, I'm interested all right so that's how that state no, I think they took it quite seriously. Uh, the um, uh, I know a couple of the principals here, and they're they're um, they're certainly the kind of they're very creative people, which can count for and against you in uh, in a conservative field like data analysis. They tried; they did not make any uh, claims of observation. Um, all right. Um, Maybe you can repeat so, the question, Eric. Oh, repeat the questions. Well, yeah. Had anyone had made any positive statements using the circle in the sky method? And I know there were a few attempts to look and they were all negative. They were all null results. We didn't see evidence, that kind of result. That was back in the early 2000s, I think. I have not kept up. Um, so to finish my, oh, finish my discussion of cosmology, I want to talk about the Einstein equation, the way that I'll treated. So there it is, very familiar, a right-hand side denoted by T, which is a string of symbols here, but basically this means I'm going to model it by a fluid with a, um, an energy density, which is little mu. Can I indicate without doing something terribly wrong? Let me try the pointer. Uh, wrong one. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, uh, the U itself will actually be the tangent vector to the flow of matter. So matter will be treated as a fluid. Uh, the tangent vector of the fluid flow will be the U. Uh, the uh, little mu is the mass energy density, the P, the pressure, which will actually be a tensor. So the capital Pi will be the anisotropic part. P will just be the trace. Have a cosmological constant. And I'm using boldface for the space-time metric because I want to work with a spatial metric and I've just goofed again. And so there we go. <laughs> so I want to work mostly with the spatial metrics. It's convenient to have the uh, unadulterated little g for the spatial metric. So notice that I have no quote unquote cross terms in the metric. I'm going to assume no rotation. That, however, will be really my only assumption throughout the talk, that the universe is not rotating. I'm not going to make, uh, as Robert's pointed out, uh, homogene homogeneity and isotropy assumptions. Um, so right. you mentioned a cosmological constant at the bottom, but it doesn't appear in any of your formulas yet. Oh, does it not? Oh, it's going to appear here, I think. Okay. It's going to, it, it is going to appear. Oh, right. thank you. Yeah, right, it should. So I should have explicitly added it to the right-hand side up there. Uh, so let's uh, let's fold it in and pretend that it's it's there on the right hand side. So it, it will certainly appear. Oh, am I going to make it obey any? No, uh, just irrotational, but I'm not going to make it obey any dynamics. Okay. So the 
what we've called the Ehlers-Ellis equation has appeared over the years in papers by these people, strangely, never with a derivation. So when we wrote this up, we provided a derivation. It was sort of one of our selling points. Um, it's appeared first, I think, in 1971. So here's our assumption of space-time metrics, simply no quote-unquote cross terms, no dt dx uh, cross term in the space-time metric. Irritational vector field describing the fluid flow, and I'll use uh, the, uh, the uh, inverse norm of, of uh, the, the norm of uh, dt to be phi, so inverse phi will make that a unit vector, which I will decompose into an acceleration. Again, I'm going to try this thing with some, there we go. Uh, I will decompose that into an acceleration term, which is right here. So that's actually the um, X is the uh, derivative. It's the, it's the double dot. It's the time derivative of the velocity, so to speak. And then uh, everything else, the nabla without boldface, which you can barely distinguish, but that will be in the spatial slices. That's actually the projection of connection in the spatial slices and give you the connection in the spatial slices. And that can further be decomposed. So just because these symbols are probably going to come up and they're going to be a bit annoying, that can further be decomposed into a trace. This thing is fun to play with because it doesn't, it doesn't do what you think. A trace, which is almost covered by the hand symbol, just disappeared and a shear. So we'll get rid of the, we'll delete the rotation. All right, so capital X is the acceleration. And with that capital X, it turns out that Ehlers, Ellis, a couple of collaborators, they wrote these down, uh, Ehlers without Ellis and Ellis without Ehlers, but both with collaborators, as I recall. You, the Einstein equation gives you this equation at the bottom for the spatial metric. And I put it in that form because it's in the sort of favorite form of mine, the smooth, uh, uh, Bakri Emery Ricci tensor on one side, and then on the other side, all the matter variables. But unfortunately, a couple of these x terms have sat over there as, as well. So that's the equation I want to analyze. All right, so this brings me to smooth Bakri Emery Ricci curvature, which is that thing on the left. So here's the definition. Uh, the x here is the negative of the x on the other side, so it's the negative acceleration, in fact. There's a parameter which I'll call little m, which can take any value other than zero and can be infinite, but I'm going to take it to be positive and um, um, finite in this talk. Catch up on, I have a preview here, but I'm not good at looking at it, but it will tell me what's coming up next. The gradient case is uh, perhaps familiar to those from the metric measure theory side of things, because the great, when X is a gradient, I can rewrite that Lie derivative as a Hessian of a function, and that function can be the density with respect. It can be, if you have a reference measure and you have the uh, uh, Riemannian measure, the relation between them is one is e to the f times the other. So then this uh, curvature tensor is natural in that setting. So why? Well, in my case, because of the Ehlers-Ellis equation. It happens, however, and I guess I'll go through at least some of the entries on the list. It happens that much of what you can prove for bounded Ricci curvature, you can prove for bounded Bakri Emery Ricci curvature. The case where M is infinity, so one of the terms the previous slide's not there, happens to be the Ricci soliton equation, and that's quite um, quite popular for its own in its own right. Um, if M is a positive integer, then you can get this from uh, a warp product. It's the uh, equation that holds on the base of the Einstein equation holds uh, for the warp product. Uh, let's see, anything that I really should tell you about this as we go down the list. I think that's almost everything. The, the only other thing that I'd like to mention is that if M is two, this also shows up in physics. It's called the near horizon geometry equation. And there's a conference here in two weeks and I'm supposed to speak then. I'm gonna speak about that equation when the conference comes up. All right, so in Bakri Emery notation, here's our equation that I want to deal with. And I've got a lot of terms on the right, including a couple that have an X in there, which is not helpful, but they're there. I will group it as follows. I'll just take all those terms and group them into first one, 
will be the um, non-gravitational energy density, the matter energy density. The second one will be the cosmological constant. Cosmologists refer to this as dark energy. All the others I will absorb basically into something that I'm going to call epsilon. And I'm going to set my scale using the Hubble constant. So I'm going to multiply and divide by it where convenient. Right. So I don't think I really need to tell you much, except that that is what I'm interested in from here onward. Whoops. It's the mean curvature. It's the Hubble. It's a function. It's still got the time function. It's still dependent on time in there. I haven't, uh, it's not H zero. It will actually change over time. I am assuming compactness. Um, I'm assuming spatial compactness. I'm not assuming anything about time though. So, and it's a function of time. So, okay. Um, so I can take the infimum of space. Uh, it's just an upper bound. I've got an inequality here, actually a lower bound. I've got an inequality here and it's, just, no, it's an upper bound. It's an upper bound for all of the, the contribution of all of the matter. So what I'd like to do is basically try to take that to be effectively small. Uh, epsilon is the difference between that and one. And I'd like to take that we get close to closure density. It'll, it'll come up. So the first, uh, Uh, what you should think of is that all the mass energy density in the universe is concentrated into the first two terms, and they're very close to one. And all the other contributions are small. So we know that in total, this thing adds up to about 1.01 minus one. So that 1.01, I'm going to claim, comes mostly from there, and not very much at all from there. Um, okay. But then you're also assuming your vector field has small now. Yeah, I've got to assume that the vector field is small norm, which is not so great, but the divergence I have to assume, well, I don't necessarily have to assume they have small norm. I have to assume that they cancel against the other terms, but basically, yes, I have to assume that. Uh, and so for the vector, so you know, x squared being small makes x small, but uh, the divergence doesn't make the, uh, the off diagonal, doesn't make the, the, uh, the off diagonal in terms of the divergence small. So yeah, I, I'm not happy about having to do that. <laughs> I do have to do it. Good. Um, so there's a Myers type theorem. In other words, uh, I mentioned before that when, the, um, that when you have enough density, the universe has to be spatially closed. And that's what Myers' theorem does for us. Uh, in this, so in the setting, if this quantity is great, if the quantity on the right, the whole collection is uh, greater than a lower bound, where have I written the lower bound? But if the, the lower bound has to be simply, um, so somewhere, somewhere, I, somewhere I need to say, oh, I see, uh, I have, um, I have epsilon as a, uh, as a constant. So provided this combination on the right is greater than, than one, it will be at least, it'll be greater than a constant, which is greater than one. And therefore um, the universe would have to be compact. So if you, in other words, if you achieve closure density, if these things minus, so put a one minus epsilon on the other side, that's constant. If these things add up to be greater than or equal to that, then you've got to be close which is not going to surprise anyone. So um, then in that case, M is spherical. It has to also be true. Not only are you closed, but you have to, um, you have, to have a, a finite um, uh, covering group. Uh, you have to have a finite fundamental group. And so therefore you're covered by three sphere and you can only be the three sphere or quotient of the three sphere by all of these words put together. You can estimate the diameter of the universe this way, by the way. Um, the estimate that I, I wrote the formula, I'm not sure if I wrote the numbers, maybe it's on the next slide. Ah, oh, there it is. So uh, using the numbers that people observe, I've put in the, uh, the data from the Planck collaboration. And if you believe all of that, then uh, 
the diameter of the universe should be about that. And that's about 100 times as far as we can see right now, so we're safe. Now, the Planck collaboration people, and I know this from experience, get upset when you put this on the board because uh, they create this data by actually assuming that the universe is FLRW. And they essentially ask now, if you're FLRW, what parameters can you extract? So the assumption has gone in here that you're FLRW. And they say, well, you can't do that when you're not FLRW. So um, I have to say that just in case. So what can one say about the topology when the universe is not closed? And uh, those figures, the plus and minus of 95% confidence, you'll get, uh, you'll get to zero with about 85% confidence. So you're only dealing with the other 15%. But it turns out that a very abstruse piece of mathematics to my mind, and I think for many of you it's not, but to my mind, called the almost splitting theorem actually provides some information. And that's kind of the fun part for me is that you can extract something from this. So the cheeger gromal splitting theorem to start with. Um, a Riemannian splitting is basically the, uh, if, if it's not familiar to you, it's basically the Pythagoras theorem in a sense. It really tells you that your manifold, maybe it looks like this is a slice and we don't know anything about that slice, but there is one direction at least that splits off. And the square, however you compute the square length in this direction, we don't know, but you compute it. You can compute the square length in that direction and it will add up to the square length in that direction. So it's not quite the Pythagoras theorem because you don't know the Pythagoras theorem applies in that slice, but you know that it applies in the split off direction. So that's a, that's a way of thinking about it. If it's either not familiar to you or if you come from the metric measure space, uh, tradition where that really is what you mean by splitting. Um, so there it is. Phrased this way, if you have non-negative Ricci curvature, then, and if you have a so-called line, I haven't phrased it quite in the way that you see it, but by a line, I mean that you have one direction at least where you can draw a geodesic and that geodesic will minimize the distance between two points. Geodesics always do that if the two points are close, but it will do it also no matter how far away the two points are. If you have that, then the jargon is that you have a line and then you can split it off and it splits off down here. You can do this as long as you keep having lines and then you stop. I've chosen the phrasing where you might have no line at all and then you get K equals zero, no splitting. But you can do this so long as you can find lines in what remains after you've split off the previous line. And it happens as well that the Ricci curvature condition descends to G, which I want to make a small point about later. This was extended uh, to the Bakri Emery case by these people. Um, in the case of gradient, Bakri, uh, gradient vector field, and myself with Marcus Curry and Will Wiley extended it to general x uh, a couple of years ago at the time not thinking of this project so ricci limit spaces and so now i've switched from talking about cosmology about which i know very little to talking about these things Richie solid. So here I'm only doing finite M. So I'm not dealing with solitons here. Oh, okay. So for finite M, that's a little bit Finite M and smooth. So um, uh, not uh, not dealing with anything that might have conical singularities or be metric measure or any such thing. But finite M, you can split it down. Is that the same theorem or you need to extract? Uh, no, uh, try to remember, I guess you might need a boundedness condition on X in the norm, but, um, basically no. <laughs> I mean, you have to learn how to deal with the Wittgen Laplace and the back yeah. and the center of 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 the now, what I, can, what I can remember is almost always when you do things in this case, you need upper boundedness on F to prove almost anything. So I'm trying to remember if you need to replace, if you need something. No, you don't think? 
he mentioned it. We need the M we we need a dimension. Otherwise, so it goes from space, so it does not appear in the point of view of Yeah, that's right. It's certain yeah, there are counter examples for Ricci solar on now that I now that I remember. Okay, so um we will Ricci limit spaces, which dates back to uh Chigar and Colding, a series of papers in the 1990s. This one came from a particular paper. Um, so basically here the idea is if you've got a sequence of manifolds and they don't quite satisfy the right condition, they don't quite satisfy the um, Ricci positivity condition, but we're going to send them to zero from below. And if you have a, um, if you have a line, then does the limit space split? So this was the subject of a uh, PhD student, uh, Marie Yaramilo, student of Guofang Wei, I think, uh, back in 2013, for the case where the, the case, case of gradient vector field. Uh, Jiang Zhu and someone else, no, I guess not, um, did it in the Bakri Amri case where along the sequence X vanished. And so we had to do it in the case of um, where X does not vanish. We don't need to take this to zero anymore, but we need boundedness, which we're always going to get on a compact manifold. So we're safe there, Galloway, Curry, and myself. Okay. Uh, if you, uh, there are some key steps in the proof and maybe without really going through the proof, I'll mention the key steps almost so that I can relearn them. One goes through a series of improvements in the almost splitting theorem. And the one that's easiest to understand, I think, is the abresh gromov estimate. You see if um, I can get ahead of myself a little bit here. So to understand this, let me go to the picture, which is the next slide. The idea is to take two points, which are very far separated, Q plus Q minus. And then take a midpoint, which is literally almost in the middle. So they are almost along a line. The distance from Q minus to P, distance from P to Q plus is almost equal to the distance from Q minus Q plus. That little epsilon, which, is, um, which I've used for too many purposes here. So this is a new epsilon, sorry, let's try. There you go. That little epsilon there just indicates the little deviation that these things make from a line. So I'll call that an almost line. You take them uh, a very large separation L apart. You take the Ricci curvature, which uh, is delta as the lower bound on that. You take that, it could be negative, but not too negative. The idea is if you take all three of these parameters to zero simultaneously, so you're taking the thing, you're taking the Q plus Q minus off to infinity. You're making the epsilon line up, of course, a small neighborhood is going to split. Manifolds do that. That's just normal. What is um, unusual and surprising is that you get the splitting on a ball about that thing, which is comparable in size to L. By comparable, it means that it has to be, um, you know, K times L, let's say, one quarter L or some such thing. So as you take L to infinity and start to satisfy the conditions of the splitting theorem, you get a big ball that satisfies the splitting theorem and it just gets bigger, bigger, bigger. That's, um, that's okay. <laughs> so that's how you get, uh, that, that's what, uh, that's what the uh, bresch gromol estimate will do for you. And so you have to use it here. The Chigar gromol classically assumes a line. Here you only have almost lines. Now, if you do the, uh, so many of you are familiar with the way these theorems work. And again, I'll just draw a hand-waving sketch. What one uses the line for is you go in both directions along the line. You fix a point here, and then you move off a distance t. You get a new center there, and you do the same thing the other direction. You get a center there. Now you draw a distance level set from these new centers. And the hope is that when they meet in the middle, they won't meet with a gap, and they won't meet with an overlap, they'll just squish. And when they just squish, it gives you a nice slice here. So here you have an almost situation where you can do that. So you need to go, so these, uh, these things are called Bussemann, these things are called level sets of Bussemann functions, these sets that should squish. 
And it turns out that as you grind through the proof, you get that these things really should be, you, you try to get them to be harmonic functions. That's the first step. And then when you get them to be harmonic functions, you try to do a little better. Not only does the uh, Laplacian vanish, the Hessian vanishes. And when you get the Hessian vanishing, that's a linear function. That's basically a plane. If you think of it that way, you, if you haven't, um, if this is unfamiliar to you, you will understand. I, uh, I brought this up on the way to lunch with a couple of you. I don't believe there's any Lorentzian theory here at all. And I can't see any reason why, the, uh, uh, why you can't get this for a time-like splitting in the Lorentzian case. I'm not so sure that it's well motivated, but there was some discussion on the way to lunch that maybe, uh, maybe eventually it will be. So uh, I've snuck that into the slide. Okay, let's try to... I got like five minutes, right? <laughs> 10 maybe, we did start late. Um, all right, so, um, so the idea is to build these approximate Boussemann functions using this almost line and so forth. And they are almost harmonic. So the actual proof itself uh, replaces them with something that's exactly harmonic. And of course that moves the approximation into doing that. So you get these um, uh, harmonic uh, replacement functions that basically are playing the role of the, their level sets are basically playing the role of the level sets of the Boosman functions and you grind through the technology. I have not put that on the slide. I uh, will have nightmares tonight if I try to remember going through it. So let's uh, cut to the taste, uh, chase. So that gives you a quantitative splitting called the quantitative Pythagoras theorems. Quantitative in the sense that everything is almost. So here I've drawn, here I've written it out, and the x, y, and z here are meant to be vertices of a triangle. So I want to go back to my previous diagram where I've got a slice there, and I've got a point in here, another point out here, and I choose the, uh, uh, I draw my, my line so that uh, this is, uh, well, let's see, so. I label it. I'm not quite sure what labeling I've used here. W. So there's a W. This is uh, X and Z, uh, Z and X, something like that. And you get the almost Pythagoras theorem with an error that here is capital Psi. The point of the notation, the vertical slash, what you got to prove is that it's these three parameters, the deviation from Ricci being positive, the DV, your almost line, the deviation from it being precisely a line, and the separation of your two far points. If you send that separation to infinity and those two to zero, you've got to get zero over here. Psi has to have that property. It depends on a lot of other things, but they're on the other side of that line. They don't matter. So in, the, uh, in our theorem, lots of wording. But the main point is X has got to be on that side of the line, not that side of the vertical bar. That's what you got to prove that X shows up on that side. You do not need to take X to zero as Ju and Jang did to get a splitting. So there's a theorem. I won't even bother to, to read it out. So, Oh, the calligraphic C is just, uh, it has to be bounded, but you don't have to take it to zero. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. And, so and I, we're going to... Right? That's right. And we're going to be on compact manifolds for our application, so we always have a bound. No, no, so, first of course, but given that the manifold here varies, uh, I have no idea what it is a fixed vector field uh, if I don't have a manifold a priori. So, it, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yes, I see. <laughs> right, I do so, see. Calligraphic C, right? Yes, know. yes. Yeah. yeah, calligraphic C is the... Uh, it's the, it's, it's the bound that you would have to deal with if you didn't uh, have a definition of vector field. Okay, um, I, I, just a quick remark is that a, a weakness here is precisely for the reason you mentioned, uh, the limit space doesn't necessarily have to be a manifold. And since the limit space doesn't have to be a manifold, uh, we don't necessarily know in advance what means Ricci curvature on these things. So uh, we have no statement about the, uh, Ricci curvature condition descending to the slice. Now, nor did Jaramillo. And uh, the, in that case, I would think you could probably get something because in that case, uh, she dealt with the case where X was a gradient. And so you're really in the metric measure case. So you can really uh, 
just uh, put a just just uh, uh, deal with the measure other than the read other than the uh, to see what I mean. So <laughs> I think you could probably get something there, but we can't. No, wait. Got a couple of minutes for topological consequences, so let's try to get through them. Um, fundamental group of a rotating universe. My problem is I don't keep up on my preview, so I don't know what's coming till it comes. All right, so if the closure density is reached, then you have Myers-Liss theorem. You've got to be closed. And furthermore, if you pass to the covering space, all the Riemannian conditions are still in place when you pass to the covering space. So that's any covering space has got to be closed. So the universal covering space has to be closed. So your fundamental group is finite. So space is finitely covered by Reeser. If um, closure density is not reached, there are a whole list of consequences of the almost splitting theorem, and they all apply. But the picture on the next slide is probably going to cut through some of the difficulty, I suppose. Just think of um, you know, the example of two bagels that have been baked and baked together. Uh, that's a compact hyperbolic manifold. Now, if you actually go to the, you know, to Tim Horton's donuts and buy two such things, they are not negatively curved because they're embedded in three space, but I want you to imagine ones that are negatively curved everywhere. So you can look at a little region of curvature and it's negatively curved, goes sort of like that. And of course, it's just a trivial observation that if you make this thing bigger, it'll still go like that, but a little less, a little less, a little less. The diameter, the size of that thing is what matters. So if you're trying to preclude something like this, we can only preclude it on small enough scales. We can't preclude it on every scale. So uh, catch up again to myself. So the theorem that we have, which is just um, it follows, immediate, it follows immediately from the cheeger coding theory, because we're basically saying we have the cheeger coding theory. X appears on the other side of, um, uh, of the limit. So we assume the four-dimensional Einstein equations, no rotation. Um, anything else that I need to mention? So if you are a little bit below closure density, but not too far below closure density, and if your diameter is not too big, then the fundamental group is almost abelian. Now, if almost abelian means about as much to you as it does to me, think of it this way. Um, if you have an abelian group, so if you have, let's take any group, you write out a word in that group by assembling the letters. Say you have a G here and a few more letters and a G inverse. If that group is non-abelian, you can't commute those through. If it is abelian, you can, and they kill each other. G, G inverse, it's gone. You get a smaller word. So the closer you are to being abelian, the smaller your fundamental group, the less topology. If you think of it that way, then I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite intuitive. And in fact, it's a theorem. It's not a definition, but it is a theorem that almost abelian groups are finitely covered by abelian groups. And they're small in, a certain set, in the sense that I just described. So this basically rules out connected sums of primes. If your diameter is small enough. The geometrization theorem provides a list of the abelian groups, three manifolds compact three manifolds, S3, which we knew we had, these two as well. These also arise if Ricci were not greater than zero, but greater than or equal to zero, you'd have those two anyway, and you'd have connected sums. So it's basically the same list as the Ricci positive. Now, remember, we're finitely covered by abelian groups, so we've undone some quotients, so you can take quotients here. So we have to have those, or, so the list is if your diameter is small, you get those or quotients. There's the moral, which is what I just said. And I think the one thing I should add to the moral is that this uh, is for quote unquote small diameters. So of course the question should be how small? 
And the, uh, uh, even though all of these theorems come with the uh, adjective quantitative, quantitative splitting theorem, so forth, we don't know. That is actually beyond the technology. That I can't answer. And with that, I'll stop. Online audience. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm coming from my way of thinking about the part that I use. Would they be able to write uh, statements about that are you uh, per pair message around that? Yeah. And then translate it back. Um, so what's the can, Eric can you repeat the question please oh yeah so uh, what about perturbations of uh, FLRW so if by perturbations you mean small geometric perturbations that the topology has not changed so uh, if um, uh, so it would sort of depend on what you mean, because you can actually change the uh, topology while in some sense the geometry doesn't, the, the metric functions that you write down may not look terribly different. Uh, let me see if I can think of a good example. Very large diameter, very large diameter. Uh, you write down the metric functions. They're all local things. I would have a hard time looking at the local metric functions and recognizing, yeah, that's smooth on S2 cross S1, but not smooth on S3. So it depends what you mean by perturbation, really. So some perturbations don't change the topology at all, but you could have a meaning of perturbation where uh, you would, in the underlying topology, there would be a change. And so then, then my answer would be that what you would write down would have some sort of global problem, but it would be very hard to recognize. So a, a use of a really well-defined perturbation would not change the topology. And therefore you would be in the, the short list of FLRW possibilities already. You could, you could still get the epsilons and everything. Yeah. Oh, true. Well, I, it's not really a question. It's more of a comment about this uh, Ricci curvature passing to the quotient uh, sort of manifold. What I want to say is that even in the um, Chigar and Colding theory, in the almost splitting, in principle, you don't have that information because in principle, you don't know whether this almost quotient space is actually even a manifold That's at true. all. Yeah. So, exactly. so, so in some sense, uh, it is still true that you can choose uh, a, an appropriate almost quotient space that has no negative reach in the appropriate sense, but for that, you really need to go into this uh, metric measure theory of RCD spaces. In fact, this quotient space is not even a rich limit in particular. So in some sense, this is something that, and this is perhaps to the students following my course, in some sense, the end of my course will be, you know, getting information, uh, about this almost splitting uh, uh, manifold through the metric theory. So that's what we will learn about this smooth world out of. Yes. Yes. That may help me learn more about the almost splitting theorem than the smooth case too, which I, um, in reviewing my slides, I realized. Yes, Eric. Um, so just generally, if you did include rotation, but assumed it was like really small, do you think you could get some sort of results? I, I like would think things we didn't try. I would think it would just go through. Um, we didn't generate a lot of interest in the cosmology community because they are all, for good reason, uh, believers in FLRW to start with. If we had generated more interest, we would have gone there. And I'm not against going there, but there doesn't seem to be enough interest from the cosmology community right now to... Uh, um, to really motivate things, but if there's interest elsewhere, <laughs> mathematical relativity. Yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we can we can we can. Can you please wrap? So, um, for 
so in order to get a um, quantitative diameter bound for your statement, unwrapping your arguments, what would you need to quantify? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I really, I really do not, I really do not know. Um, I want to have to go back to the, the, those Cheeger and Gromall arguments and be extremely careful about everything that you're grouping into. I do not know. I, I, I sort of hope that would be possible to do something approximate. Maybe one can, I don't know. I honestly don't. I'm sorry, what was that question? The question, uh, uh, Christina, was um, oh, two microphones. I don't need that. <laughs> the, the question was, it, could you actually uh, quantify psi? I mean, really quantify psi. In other words, could you, um, um, you could you compute psi or at least estimate it? Given so the some... Abrash Kumal has a very specific, specific psi. Um, the the Abrash Kumal one is a very nice formula that's very useful. And then well, Cheeger Calding do not quantify their psi. Okay. Is there, so in the Abresh Gromal one, can you, so all the parameters that are on the right hand side in psi, uh, you get a, can you take account of those if you know? Yeah, it's exact formula. Oh, wow. And, 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 and it's very useful. It's been used um, on many settings. There you go. <laughs> Actually, that's, uh, yeah, so. Um, that, that, thanks. That's 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 interesting. Yeah. So generally, uh, what I've done in the past in the Romanian setting is is uh, you use I you can use the Cheeger calling for for oh it's it's almost this it's almost that but then when you actually want to estimate something you run up you run back to a brush from all to get the the actual. And estimate. I meant to mention at the start of this, but this was uh, the genesis of this was a conversation between Marcus. And Christina and myself at uh, Stony Brook and it was? Marcus, Marcus <laughs> said to you, you know, we need something like this. And you said, that's the almost splitting theorem. Oh. <laughs> so I forgot to that's mention that at the start, but I certainly should <laughs> Well, have. I don't remember this, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, the, the Abrash Kamal theorem is, is actually not hard to read the proof either. It's, um, it's yes, that, that's true. harmonic that's, that's... functions, distance functions, uh, you know, Ellipse, you know, it's harmonic, it's it's yeah. Laplacians, it's very straightforward. And Cheeker Calding is very difficult and takes much more. Um, yes, and there's a monograph on Cheeker Calding, and I don't know about you, but I really, apart from having it, was like a telephone book, it had the results, but it was, you know, it will never win the Nobel Prize in literature. <laughs> um, the papers, the papers were actually better than the uh, than the monograph, um, but the monograph did have like telephone book you could look everything up and it was there but yeah, well, the original abresh from all paper is very clear and readable by anyone who with partial differential equations back it's like it's 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 it doesn't need uh it doesn't need the grom of hausdorff it doesn't need the metric measure yeah it's it's much more straightforward geometric analysis it's method of barriers maybe a little bit yeah, you need barriers or distributions probably, but. Um, yeah, they just use barriers though. So they're not they using, I mean, it's a somewhat, I mean, it's, if you have a, a partial differential equations background, it's readable. It doesn't need the, the more um, subtle geometric measure, the, um, the metric measure theory it doesn't need. In the interest of time, maybe we take a few minutes break. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's because I don't understand cosmology. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Uh, well, 
I couldn't think of. Uh, oh no! So the um, so of course in the Romanian case you have um, uh, the uh, you know she can go off in the monastery and all the that's the that's the uh, 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 since you don't have that the Romanian case. Because uh, then you sort of worry about uh, uh, what goes to zero, how it pass. But then in the other one, I, in the remaining ones, I dropped the square because I didn't need things to go to zero. I just needed a bound on the norm of x. And so that's the same as the bound on the norm of x squared. So I just dropped it. I only noticed it later that square had been dropped everywhere. Uh, I only restored it in one place, but it's only crucial in another place. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, the type of perpendicular to the square. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y